believe that God has a provision for your body. God has not omitted your body from his provision. And it is really important that as believers we get to know the nature of our body, God's purpose for our body, and God's provision for our body. At the beginning of our study, we went to the account given in Genesis 2, verse 7, of the initial creation of man, which is one of the most crucial passages of Scripture, because until we understand our origin, we really don't understand ourselves. Now, I am simple-minded enough to believe that it happened the way the Bible describes it. I've been a professor at Britain's largest university for nine years. I hold various degrees and various academic distinctions. And I feel in many ways I'm quite sophisticated intellectually. But I don't feel in any way intellectually inferior when I say that I believe the Bible record of creation. Prior to believing the Bible, I had studied many other attempts to explain man's origin and found them all unsatisfying and in many cases self-contradictory. I turned to study the Bible as a professional philosopher, not as a believer, and I commented to myself, at least it can't be any sillier than some of the other things I've heard. And to my astonishment, I discovered it had the answer. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we read this. I think it's good to read it. It's a very short, simple statement. The Lord God, Jehovah God, it's God's personal name that's used there, a personal God, formed a personal man for personal fellowship between them. The Lord God formed or molded man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. I have pointed out there is the union of God's divine eternal breath from above with the body of clay from beneath, molded by the hands of the Creator, and that the union of spirit from above and clay from beneath produced a living human personality. Now in our studies during the week we've dealt essentially with the inner personality of man, spirit, and soul. But let us not be blind to the fact that man's body is also a miraculous and marvelous creation of God. Most believers do not sufficiently value or care for their own bodies. Until the breath of God entered that clay form, it was just clay, that's all it was. And it became a living, functioning, physical body with all its organisms, with all its parts, with all its members, through the miraculous operation of the Spirit of God. Take just one human eye. I was watching one Sunday morning a telecast, and the American Society of Ophthalmologists presented some information on the human eye. It was fascinating. If I remember rightly, they said one human eye contains more than three million working parts. What brought that into being? The breath of God. All our muscles, our nerves, our glands, every function in our physical bodies owes its origin to the inbreathed breath of God. That's what transformed the clay into these marvelous physical organisms. When you grasp that, see, miracles of healing are logical. Divine healing is the most logical thing. Who can better repair and restore and if need be recreate the body than the same agent who initially formed it, the Spirit of God. And in recent years, I've been privileged to witness many creative miracles of God where bones that were 
were not there were restored. Uh, I've been asking prayer through the week for a little girl in San Jose, California. Her elder sister was born without a bone in each upper leg. And as a result of prayer, God has created the bone. This is, I don't say it's simple, but it's very understandable when you understand the origin of the human body. It was just clay till the Spirit of God moved upon it and worked upon it and produced these organisms. Turn to the book of Job for a moment, the 10th chapter. There are tremendous revelations in the book of Job and there's a wonderful interrelationship between Genesis and Job in many ways. Job chapter 10 verses 8 through 12 is a beautiful summation of God's creative work in our bodies. Job chapter 10 verse 8 through 12. Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about. As in Genesis where the word form indicates very careful skillful work. So Job also emphasizes the immense skill and care that God devoted to forming the human body. Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. This is Job's problem which we're not dealing with. Remember, I beseech thee, that thou hast made me as the clay, and wilt thou bring me into dust again? Hast thou not poured me out like milk? and curdled me like cheese. What a vivid expression, isn't it? <laughs> Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. What a beautiful picture of the interrelationship of the various main parts of the body. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. And then in Job 32, verse 8, we have the other aspect of man's nature, the spiritual aspect. Job 32, 8. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration or the inbreathed breath of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So Job is in perfect accord with Genesis. It's the union of the breath of God from above with the clay from beneath that brings into being a total personality. And then we turn to the words of David in Psalm 139 and uh, read there from verse 13. Psalm 139, David's own recognition of the miracle of his physical body. And I do wish to emphasize that in my observation, the majority of Christian believers do not sufficiently appreciate their own bodies. If you had to pay for the equipment you've got in your body, first of all, you couldn't pay for it. Secondly, believe me, you'd take a lot more care of it. Psalm 139, verse 13. For thou hast possessed or formed my reign. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I believe that to be true. When I consider the physical body, it fills me with a sense of awe. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance or my bone was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That tells me that the substance that eventually became my body was planned and formed by God in the earth long before it ever entered my body. And God had appointed the substance that was one day to constitute my body. Verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. God had a blueprint for my body and your body before it ever came into being. Nothing happened by chance. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance for fashion, when as yet there was none of them. So God brought 
my body, your body into being on a blueprint. And there's a number for every member. Every member is written up in God's book. You want to compare that with the statement of Jesus in Luke 12, 7? He said, Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. That's the detail of God's concern for our physical body. He has the number of the hairs on our head. And I believe when we realize this, we must realize also that God has a purpose for this marvelous workmanship, which is our body. And I believe the purpose is revealed in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. And we know that First Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and 19 tells us we were redeemed, bought, not with corruptible things as with silver or with gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The redemptive price that was paid for us was the blood of Christ shed on the cross. Please note that Christ redeemed total man, spirit, soul, and body. The body was not omitted when the redemptive price was paid. So Paul says, verse 20, Ye are bought with a price. Therefore, notice that therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Jesus paid the price to redeem spirit, soul, and body. Your body belongs to God. And therefore it is to be used for God's glory. And because Jesus has paid for you, you do not belong to yourself. He owns you. And the purpose for which he redeemed your body was to be the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And when God first fashioned that first body in the garden, it was his purpose that in the fullness of time, the redeemed body of the believer in Jesus Christ should become the dwelling place, the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 7 verse 48, Stephen told the Jewish people, he said, The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. You can build any church, any synagogue, any temple, any building you like. When God's people meet there, God will meet with them. But God does not dwell in any building that's made by human hands. God has one appointed temple. It's the body of the redeemed believer. And there's a particular area in that body which is set apart for the Holy Spirit. John 7, verses 37, 38, and 39. Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 is given in parenthesis the explanation. This he spake of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because the Jesus was not yet glorified. There was a time to come, when those who believed on Jesus were to receive the Holy Spirit as a person to indwell the physical temple of their body. The first time this happened in human history was on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came down to earth as a person, took up his dwelling in the Church of Jesus Christ collectively, but took his individual dwelling in the place in the body of each believer. And I personally believe that the baptism in the Holy Spirit, when it's scripturally expounded and scripturally experienced, is the precise moment at which every believer yields to the Holy Spirit that area of his body to be his temple. The Holy Spirit is at work in the life of a believer from conviction, through conversion, through regeneration. 
But as I understand scripture and I've studied this very, very carefully, I have no doctrinal or denominational acts to grind. But as I understand, it's at the baptism in the Holy Spirit that the believer's body actually becomes the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. When I lead people in prayer to receive the baptism, I invite them to come forward, and in my prayer, I cause them to say these words. I present to you my body to be a temple of your, of your spirit. And I believe that is the moment at which the plan of God is consummated in your life and in your body. And I just wonder whether believers really appreciate this, whether we can talk so casually about things like this. To me, it's breathtaking that Almighty God the Holy Spirit, who is God, desires to and deigns to indwell my physical body. To me, this is the climax of the whole process of redemption. The cross is not the climax. Pentecost is the climax. The cross made Pentecost possible. But the whole thrust of the gospel is to the coming of the company. And I believe there's an individual transaction between every believer and the Lord, whereby that believer actually offers to the Holy Spirit that place which has been set apart from creation to be the dwelling place of the Spirit of God out of his belly. I believe there is an actual area in our physical body, below the diaphragm and by, above the pelvis, which is set apart and destined to be the place where God the Holy Spirit dwells. And this is the supreme purpose of the human body, to be the temple of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit. It is only possible through redemption the body must first be redeemed by the blood of Jesus from the dominion of Satan, from the defilement of sin, sanctified and made holy by the blood of Jesus, and then becomes a fit and worthy dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. Jesus on the cross not merely dealt with man's spiritual need, he dealt with man's physical need. He not merely bore our sins in his own body, but himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And with his wounds, we were healed. It was a total redemptive work. Nothing in me now belongs to the devil. The devil has no legal right or claim over anything of me, spirit, soul, and body. My testimony is I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus out of the hand of the devil. We've already had quoted here that beautiful verse, Psalm 107, verse 2, that the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. And it's a very good thing to say so, because your redemption is not fully effective till you say it. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto full salvation. And my testimony is this, and I make it over and over again. Through the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed out of the hands of the devil. Spirit, soul, and body, I belong to Jesus Christ. Sanctified and set apart to God by the blood of Jesus. How important it is to understand that your body is holy. The Apostle Paul in certain passages in his writings uses the word body or flesh not to denote the physical body but to denote the old Adamic nature which is rebellious and corrupt. And without rightly dividing the word of God, many Christians reading such passages have wrongly understood that Paul was suggesting that the physical body is unholy. That's ridiculous. The physical body is the masterpiece of God's physical creation. And it was created specifically to be a temple for the Holy Spirit. How 
conquered the Holy Spirit and ever contemplate indwelling something that couldn't be made holy and worthy of his presence. Now I want to make it clear that the redemption of our body is not yet complete. If I taught that, I would be teaching error. And some do teach this error. They teach that they already have received their resurrection body. It's strange, but they can persuade people to believe it. My comment on that is always just stick a pen into them and see. Now I want to deal briefly with what God will do for your body in this life and what will take place at the completion of the redemption of your body at the resurrection or the translation. In this life, first of all, turn to Romans 12, if you will. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And uh, this verse, like so many of the verses of Paul, contains the word therefore. And let me offer you the little comment I made before. When you find the therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. And actually, if you observe the structure of Romans, and I'm going to be teaching on Romans this coming week in Houston, the first eight chapters of Romans are the presentation of the gospel. Nine, ten, and eleven are an excursus that deal with God's dealings with Israel. So, Chapter 12 links really on logically with chapter 8. And Paul says, in the light of all that God has done for us, what is our logical and reasonable response? And he expresses it in this first verse of Romans 12. That's why the therefore is there. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in the light of all that God has done on our behalf, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, Notice it's the body that's holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Under the Mosaic law, the sacrifice was killed, whether it were a sheep or a bullock or whatever it might be, was killed and laid dead on the altar. Paul says, you are to present your body just as really on God's altar as that sheep or that bullet was laid on the Old Testament altar. There's only one difference. It's living on death. That's very, very vivid. Because the man who offered the sacrifice, let us say it was a sheep, killed it, placed it on the altar, and he no longer owned it. From that moment onwards, that sheep, the moment it was laid on the altar, belonged to God and not to the man. And God says, in the light of what he has done for us, there's only one logical, reasonable response. That each one of us place our physical body on the altar of God in service. In precisely the same measure and degree as the Old Testament believer placed the body of the sheep or the bullock on the altar. Now before this service closes, I'm going to challenge you, if you've never done that, to do it here this morning. It is a deliberate definite scriptural transaction that every believer should make to present his body a living sacrifice on God's altar. The scripture tells us in Matthew 23, 19, it is the altar that sanctifies the gift. When you place your body on God's altar, the contact with the altar sanctifies the body that you give and your body becomes holy by its contact with the altar. Then it is truly set apart to God. Now when you have set your part, body apart to God in this way, God says there are further things you need to do. If he, uh, Romans 6 verses 12 and 13 and there's another therefore here <laughs> which relates to the first part of Romans 6 we can't go into it except to explain that when Christ died, we died. The old nature died. And when we were baptized, the old nature was buried. And when we came up out of the water, we were resurrected to walk in newness of life. And we are to reckon ourselves dead to the old nature and to sin just as really as Christ died on the cross. So the therefore follows on from that. In verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that he's talking about. That ye should 
obey sin in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your physical members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But what are you to do with your physical members? Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, your will, your ego, your personality, and your members, your physical members as instruments of righteousness unto God. God asks that you yield the physical members of your body to Him, for Him to control as if they were His members. Your hands become His hands, your feet becomes, become His feet. Reading on Romans 6 a little further, verse 19, Paul returns to this. I feel so few Christians really understand the emphasis that's placed in the New Testament upon what we do with our bodies. Romans 6.19 I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmities of your flesh for as you have yielded your physical members slaves to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity even so now yield your physical members slaves to righteousness unto holiness that's the way to holiness to yield your physical members as servants or instruments to the Holy Spirit for him to control for his purposes for the glory of God and then in 1 Thessalonians 4, we have a scripture that we looked at earlier, but we'll come back to. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you be holy, that you be set apart to God, that you should abstain from fornication, from sexual impurity and uncleanness. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. What does it mean when it says your vessel? What's it referring to? Your physical body. And notice you are to possess it in holiness and honor. You are to honor your body. Why? Because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. See, it grieves me when I see how careless and casual Christians are with their bodies. I don't believe I would really be alive and able to preach today if God hadn't taught me to take care of my body. Why? Because it's his instrument. I've consecrated my body to the Lord. I've given to God specifically my vocal organs for him to use. I told them, Lord, they don't belong to me any longer. They belong to you. And I like that word know, that you should know how to possess. I believe a Christian should really take some time to study what and how to eat, drink, and sleep. And no one is more guilty than preachers of failing to exercise their bodies. And most preachers pay for it sooner or later. I believe in a reasonable amount of physical exercise to keep my body in a condition that glorifies God. You know, I have a criticism of modern doctors. There may be some here today. But, and I, I hope you will not get offended, but to me, the medical profession today is like people. Let me compare it to people training pilots to fly airplanes. But all they ever train them in is crash landing and bailing out. We never get any instruction on how to live healthy. Practically never. Everything is what to do, and it's not if you're sick, please notice, it's when you're sick. The American public are subtly conditioned mentally to expect to be sick. You look at the advertisements for the painkillers. It's not if you get a headache, it's when you get a headache. And how vivid and almost attractive they make it appear to have a headache. Sure, you know why? Because it's a billion dollar industry. Let's be, let's be rather realistic about that. There, is, there are very few industries in which there's a bigger markup and a larger profit than the drug industry. <laughs> what would happen if all Americans got, got well? There'd be a whole chain of industries that went bankrupt overnight. Now, we have to be careful we don't become uncharitable or un unkind. But really, actually, it is true, the American public are conditioned to expect to need tranquilizers, painkillers, pep tablets, remedies for arthritis, and all the rest. 
And your mental attitude makes a lot of difference. It makes a great deal of difference. I remember sitting with a precious brother in Denmark who was over 70 years old. He said, I've never been sick a day in my life. And everybody said, oh, isn't that remarkable? See, the implication is sickness is normal. That's not scriptural. In the scripture, health is normal, sickness is abnormal. As I said the other day, you have to search the Bible to find a believer who died of sickness. I think most of you couldn't find one. I'll tell you one, it was Elisha the prophet. I can't offhand think of another sold out believer who died sick. You don't have to be sick to die, you know that? Brother Jim Brown, the Presbyterian preacher, was preaching on this theme one day in his church because it wasn't altogether acceptable to all his congregation. And a lady met him in the foyer afterwards and said, Well, Brother Brown, I believe I'm going to die. Well, he said, Sister, die well. <laughs> and his own first wife did it. I don't know whether you know about the death of uh, Jim Brown's first wife. She was miraculously raised up from a heart disease. And she said, Every breath I breathe is supernatural from this moment on. And he, he and she were out together on the West Coast preaching. She was writing a letter to a friend, testifying of God's goodness. The last word, word she wrote was salvation, put the period, and breathed the last. That's how the believers should go. He taketh away their breath, they die and return to the earth. Now, don't be embarrassed or ashamed if you're sick. I thank God for doctors. If I need a doctor, I'll go to a doctor. But I don't, I'm not mentally conditioned to expect to be sick. I'm mentally conditioned to expect to be well because I believe it's the will of God for me. Turn on to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y entirely. Everything in you should be entirely sanctified. Let's get away from doctrinal quarrels about sinless perfection and just get down to the fact that every part of me is holy. H-O-L-Y and should be kept that way. And I pray God, Paul says, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. That's a challenging thought. What does it mean for your body to be preserved blameless? I think it means that every part of your body is consecrated to God, that Satan doesn't have any control over any area of your body. And I believe that's the revealed will of God. And I believe by his redemptive work on the cross, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ has made it possible. And that's the level I want to live on. I don't want to come lower down. Now, God has provided the means for believers to stay well. The two great means are the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Let us look at the part of each for a moment, not dwelling on either. Proverbs 4. Anybody that hears me preach long will always hear me turn to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20, 21, and 22, because these are the words that got me out of hospital. After a year in hospital, when doctors were not able to heal me, it was Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20, 21, and 22 that got me out of the hospital. And I'm eternally grateful for them. And I pass them on to anybody who will receive them. Because God showed me one thing. When I got out of the hospital, he said, I put you through this so that you can tell others what I've done for you and reveal to them the principles that I've taught you. Actually, when I came out of the hospital, the day I came out of the hospital, uh, I'm going back to Proverbs 4 in a moment, but what the verse that God gave me was Proverbs 22, verses 17 and following. After exactly 12 months in hospital, it took me one year to learn the lesson. And this is the verse that he gave me, Proverbs 22, 17. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise and apply thine heart unto my knowledge, and I can say sincerely I have done. That was 1943, and it's 
Nearly 30 years, I have applied my heart to God's knowledge. I've made a good investment. If I have to go back and do it again, I'll do the same and more. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them, that's God's word, within thee. They shall with all be fitted together on thy lips. That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. That was the day I came out of hospital. And I still trust in the Lord. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. God's word is absolute certainty. The certainty of the words of truth. That thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. God said, you have a responsibility to teach others what I've taught you. Now turn to Proverbs 4, verses 20, 21, and 22, and find God's provision for upholding your body in physical health. My son, attend to my word, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Notice it's God's words and God's sayings. Let them, the words and the sayings of God, not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. My son is addressed to every child of God. Here is God's word to you, his child. He has given you that which, if you rightly take it according to the directions, will be life to you and health to all your flesh. And in Romans 8.11, we have the other aspect of the provision of God for the believer's body. Romans 8.11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Quicken in modern English give life to. Do you realize that you have dwelling in your physical body through the baptism in the Holy Spirit the same power that raised the body of Jesus out of the tomb? That's a breathtaking thought. Can you imagine any physical need in your body that would be greater than the physical need of Jesus' body after he had been scourged, lacerated, hung on the cross, and laid away in the tomb for three days and three nights? And the Spirit of God entered that body and gave him perfect life and health. And the same power is now indwelling your physical body to quicken it, to make it alive to impart unto it divine resurrection life. That an irresistible, inexhaustible reservoir of divine life inside you. The trouble is, believers don't know how to draw. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4 and read some very beautiful words with me there. 2 Corinthians 4, there is an exchange of life. Jesus took the corrupt life that we had and terminated it on the cross. Now we're invited to share his divine, eternal resurrection life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. This is the test of the Apostle Paul. All was bearing about in the body. Please note this is in the body. The dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Verse 11, For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. There can be no doubt about the meaning of those words. Because of the exchange that took place at the cross, because Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness, because he bore our sicknesses and our infirmities, because he died our death, we are invited to participate of the resurrection life of Jesus, and it is to be made manifest, please notice that, visibly demonstrated in our mortal flesh. That's divine healing and divine health. That's the great basic principle. The same power that created your body in resurrection life is now to be made manifest in your physical body. But please note, you do not yet have your resurrection body. Be very, very careful and never misquote me on that. What you have now is resurrection life in a mortal body. 
And you've got to learn to draw on that reservoir of resurrection life to maintain your mortal body. And I believe we should look also at verse 16 of that chapter. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man is continually perishing, the body is still corruptible, it's still mortal, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, and our outward man depends on the life that comes through the inward man. We draw on the reservoir of divine life that comes into us through our spirits, by the Spirit of God. But that resurrection life is sufficient for all the needs of my mortal body as long as I have a work to do for God. God is able to keep me. Now let's look on in closing as quickly as we can to the change which will take place when redemption of our body is complete. Romans chapter 8 and we'll read from verse 18 through verse 23. I'll read it quickly. Romans 8 verse 18 through 23. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's a glory that's going to be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travelleth in pain together until now. All creation is waiting for something. And it is the manifestation of the sons of God. And let me say that I do not get identified with the doctrine and I do not accept this complete manifestation cannot take place before the resurrection. And not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the, for the adoption to wit the redemption of the body. My body is already God's property, but it is still a mortal, corruptible body. The final phase of redemption takes place at resurrection or translation. And now we turn to 1 Corinthians 15 for the account given to Paul by divine revelation of how this will take place. And I'm going to point out to you that there will be five specific changes in our body. I'll read 1 Corinthians 15 verses 42 and following. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now he's talking about the body. He's not talking about the spirit and the soul. At this point, he's talking about the resurrection of the body. In fact, it's only the body that is resurrected. The spirit and the soul are already in God's keeping. All right, now he tells us the changes that are going to take place, and I'd like you to follow them with me. I'll not be longer than is necessary. If the body is sown, that is buried in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. That's the first change from corruption to incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. That's the second change from dishonor to glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. That's the third change from weakness to power. The fourth is one that requires explanation. We dealt with it during the week. We can't go back to it in detail. It is sown a natural or a soulish body, it is raised a spiritual body. Now, we spoke about this, we can't go into detail, but Jesus, after the resurrection, had a body that was spiritual, not soulish. Apparently, it was devoid of blood. He had flesh and bones, but not blood. His blood was the propitiatory sacrifice that he had entered into the presence of God with. And he was not subject to the limits of space and time as we are in our natural body. And the scripture promises that we will have a body just like his at resurrection. Now reading on a little further, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, starting again at verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, notice that, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of, body, of God. The kind of body we have now cannot survive in God's kingdom. See, it's very interesting. Man can be projected into the moon. 
but he has to take Earth's atmosphere with him. He cannot live outside the atmosphere of Earth with the kind of body that he has now. He's still a slave to the atmosphere of Earth. He's still bound within that limit. Because it's a body of flesh and blood. The scripture says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Therefore, there has to be a change. This is the reasoning of Paul. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep in death, but we shall all be changed. Some will be changed by resurrection out of death. Others will be changed without dying. You get that? All right. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trunk, the twinkling of an eye means as long as it takes you to close your eye and open it. So one moment we'll be sitting looking at one another like this, There'll be a tremendous trumpet sound, a blinding flash of light. We'll all blink, and when we open our eyes again, we'll all be in resurrection, glorified bodies. It's going to take just that long. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And remember, in First Thessalonians 4, Paul says, We who are alive shall not go before those who sleep in death. For the dead shall be raised first, then we who are alive shall be changed. You notice this eliminates the possibility of your getting a resurrection body before the general resurrection of the dead. That's why any other teaching is an error. The dead shall be raised first, then we who are alive shall be changed. Now going back to 1 Thessalonians 15. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. There's the fifth change that was not mentioned before, from mortal to immortal. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death has been swallowed up in victory. That will be the climax. Let me just, for the sake of your understanding, repeat once more the five changes that will take place. Five is the number of the senses. These are changes that are perceptible to the senses. The changes that will take place, not in the spirit or the soul, but in the physical body of every redeemed believer at the coming of the Lord. The first change from corruption to incorruption. The second from dishonor to glory. The third, from weakness to power. The fourth, from soulish to spiritual. The fifth, from mortal to immortal. And there's one further passage of scripture we look at to complete this study. That's Philippians chapter 3. Verse 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. For our conversation, but you remember last night, those of you here, we saw the real word is citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. We may be on earth, but we've got heaven's passport. Praise the Lord. Don't be, make sure you've got your passport. Because when you go on a journey, it's frustrating to find you don't have your passport. Hang around, and miss the plane, and never get there. Because when the rapture takes place, friend, it's going to be too late getting your passport then. You've got to have it all in order. Stamp up the date with a visa for the heavenly God. All right. For our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to give him his complete title, Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall change our vile body? that it may be fashioned like under his glorious body. Now, this is a little free. This more literal translation is, he shall change the body of our humiliation, that it may be formed like the body of his glory. This is the same change that Paul says, from dishonor to glory. According to the working whereby he is able to even to subdue all things unto himself. Since man fell, 
It had a body of humiliation, a humiliating body. God's punishment for our fault. So no matter how rich you may be, and no matter what beautiful clothes you may wear, you begin to move around a little quick, and you perspire, and you get, in plain language, smelly. No matter what foods you eat on, you go to the finest of restaurants, eat and drink the best, you still have to go to the bathroom. You've got a body of humiliation. Much uh, salesmanship in America today is trying to kid you into the fact that you don't have a body of humiliation. You know, everything is getting nicely covered over. And you have this and that kind of thing that is designed to make you think that your body really is all right the way it is. But it isn't. It's a body of humiliation. And it's a humiliating body because we're under judgment for sin. But there's going to come a day when we'll be liberated from this body of humiliation and we'll have a body of glory just like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the climax of redemption. And it concludes with the change in our body. And praise God, that's one thing sure, there's going to be a resurrection. I always think, and I close with this, but I remember, my wife will remember this, in Kenya, in East Africa, one of our students' mother, the mother of one of our students, died. And we felt we ought to go and comfort her and the family. And without planning it, we arrived at just the time the funeral was to take place. And I've never seen anything so pathetic and poor in all my life. The hut was built of grass, and the roof had been partly damaged by fire. According to African custom, the grave was dug about 50 feet in front of the front entrance to the hut. There was this big, gaping hole in the red earth. The younger children were running around without anybody to care for them or show any interest in them. And the body of the woman was clad in a kind of white, dress, white night dress, but everything in East Africa, when it gets in contact with that red mud, gets uh, irremediably muddied and never can be made white again. And so it looked dirty. And the casket was just a rough box nailed together out of planks. But the woman herself was a believer. And as I stood there and looked under that body and looked around, I was just gripped with this overwhelming sense of poverty and an unequal struggle against odds that had been too great for her. And there came such a, a realization there's got to be a resurrection. It isn't fair that it ends that way. And there came such a conviction in my heart that there's going to be a resurrection. That's not the end. That's something more to follow. When the trumpet sounds, that body will rise, free from sickness, free from pain, glorified, shining, and be gathered together with millions to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, when you believe that, comfort one another with these words. Glory to God. The Lord bless you. It's been good to be with you. If we don't meet you before, we'll meet you there.